Our first lesson this morning comes from the third chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Then he said, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to the Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Our second lesson comes from Romans, the 12th chapter, beginning at the ninth verse. Let love be genuine, hate what is good, hold fast to what is good, hold hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Know if your enemies are hungry, feed them, If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this, you'll heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
May God bless to our understanding this, the reading of God's word, and to God's name be praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. I can't let the moment pass without saying that when I saw the bucket that uh, Liz had, I thought we were going to have another one of the ice water <laughs> challenges. Um, Sue, we will issue you another certificate of baptism to go along with the birthday card later this week. You are a brave soul. It also tells me, reminds me of all the children's talks that I have that haven't gone quite as well as I expected. Today we're looking at Moses, and perhaps next to King David, one of the most familiar names of the Hebrew scriptures. Ask someone who Moses was, and you may hear a variety of answers. Some may say, well, that's the person that led the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. Some other person may say, well, that's the man that brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai and gave them to the people. Others may say, well, that's the person that was that baby in the basket that mother uh, put in the water to hide him from the soldiers of Pharaoh. Or they may just remember Charlton Heston raising his arms and parting the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments. Moses was a remarkable man who lived a remarkable life, raised in the royal court of Egypt, as an adult awakening to his Jewish roots and culture and history, murdered an Egyptian overseer for abusing some Jewish slaves and then had to flee for his life, called by God, uh, married and spent years as a shepherd living with his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, called by God to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land and engaging in that 40-year trek through the wilderness of Sinai, only to die just before entering the promised land. Today, the scripture lesson that was read for us this morning by Nancy focused on the call of Moses, the call by God to free his enslaved people, a call that took place while he was that shepherd in exile, a call that took place out of a burning bush. You know, the, the Bible is filled with accounts of God calling and speaking to people and to men and women, calling them to do special tasks, to speak God's word, to do a particular form of service in life. And throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ, God has continued to call men and women to particular tasks and to particular service. Sometimes it's a, a lifelong vocation. Sometimes it's to a position of leadership or teaching or mission in the church. Sometimes it's just to a very brief, specific task. I think when those of us, when we experience God's call, it leads us into a time of discernment. You know, what's all this about? Do I really want to do this? Am I equipped? What will happen if I do respond to God's call and what will happen if I don't? So it's a time often of anxiety. And Moses has his share of anxiety. He was not expecting a call from God. For all he knew, his future lay with tending the flocks of his father-in-law. Oh, he could dream and remember about his days in Pharaoh's court. He could still feel the pain knowing that his people were kept in slavery in Egypt. He knew of the faith of his ancestors, but he knew his fate was pretty well determined. He was now a shepherd. He was in exile. And yes, he was a murderer. So it took a dramatic encounter with God to get Moses' attention. 
God speaks out of a burning bush, a bush that flamed, but scripture said was not consumed. A bush that grew out of ground that was holy, so holy that Moses had to take off his sandals as a sign of respect. Moses hides his face from God for to look upon the face of God was to die. And then he hears God's voice. I will send you to Pharaoh and bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. A clear call from God, a commission from God, the God of Moses' people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Could have there been any doubt? Could have there been any hesitation seeing and hearing the flame and the voice? Sometimes when we think of Moses and all that he accomplished in his lifetime, we forget that his immediate response to God's call was to think of as many excuses as he could. Who am I, Lord, that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? His first response was denial. I'm not the one you want. You've made a mistake. You've got the wrong person. You've dialed the wrong number. And this might be the same response that you and I experience. Who, me? Why me? God doesn't let Moses hold on to that excuse. He says, I will be with you. His second response is to delay. Let, let, let's talk about it, God. He says, uh, if, if they ask me your name, if I go to do this and they ask me your name, who do I say has sent me? What Moses is probably really doing is playing for time, time to think this through, time to figure out another way to get out of it. But God gives Moses an answer. I am who I am. The God of all creation does not need a worldly name. The God who speaks from the burning bush is the same God who, follow, who showed compassion to the generations of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And through the use of God's name, Moses and all the faithful who have followed him down through the years can serve God and sir, do God's work. For when we hear the voice of God calling us, we can know who it is that's calling us and whom we are about to serve. Ours is not an unknown God, but the God made clear and real and true in Jesus Christ. Well, Moses senses that he's getting boxed in. But he tries another tact. He tries to defer. He says, well, suppose they, they don't believe me or listen to me and say, well, the Lord really didn't appear to you. Now, surely that will happen, Lord. They won't believe this murderer, this former prince of Egypt, this one who's been in exile, this dirty shepherd. Uh, so they're not going to believe me in the first place. Why bother going down this road? God says, well, I'll give you signs and wonders so that they will believe you. When God calls us, God gives us gifts beyond our imagining. Well, Moses tries again. I'm not eloquent. I'm slow to speak. I'm slow to tongue. I can't represent you. And God doesn't even hesitate. God says, I will give you the words. And so time after time, God blesses those whom God has called with the gifts of words. Well, one last try. Moses says, okay, I've heard all this. Send someone else. When all else fails, pass the buck. Anyone but me. And then we see God showing some frustration and anger. He said, your brother Aaron can speak well. He'll be your spokesman. You don't have to do this alone. There will be others to help. And scripture records that Moses accepts the call. He understood finally that God would be with him, that he would be given the gifts he needed, that God's word would come to his mouth, mouth and Aaron would be their spokesman, and that he now carried with him the name of God. We live in equally challenging times. We live in a world that is sometimes confused, 
and changing and troubled and violent. We live in a world where violence seems to be the, the way of the day, where we see examples of greed, both corporate and personal. It's a world that's often marked with injustice and failure and corruption and total, sometimes, paralysis of systems and helpers. Yet as people of faith, we look to God to somehow intervene. We want God to change our world, to intervene with God's power to right the wrongs, to bring peace with justice, to put everything right again. In other words, we look for miracles. How unsettling it is when we realize that God seeks to work through us. Like Moses, we're called to do hard things. Like Moses, we can quickly try to find excuses. But like Moses, we're given the promise of God's name, the promise of God's presence, the power of God, the gifts of God, and partners in which to do God's work. And we've learned the name of God. And we've seen the face of God in Jesus Christ. So that when God calls us, when God urges us on, we don't need to hide, be afraid, or turn away. We can answer, here I am. Amen.